Scholars refer to Romans chapter 8 as the Mount Everest of the Bible. If Romans is the Himalayas, then uh, chapter 8 is the Mount Everest. F. Gaudet, the Swiss commentator, called these 39 verses great because they begin with no condemnation and they end with no separation. To which another writer, C.A. Fox, added that in between, there is also no defeat. There's no condemnation, there's no separation, and there's no defeat for the child of God. Prominent in this chapter is the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is mentioned 19 times in reference to what he does in this chapter alone. He's referred to as the Spirit of life in verse 2. He's the Spirit who lives in us in verse 9. He's the Spirit who raises us from the dead, verse 11. I see the Lord do this every Sunday morning as I'm preaching. That was a bad joke. <laughs> Actually, I see people, never mind. Uh, <laughs> If you have a bad joke, it doesn't work. You don't keep going forward. Uh, he is the spirit of adoption in verses 14 through 17. He's the spirit who bears fruit in verse 23. He's the spirit who helps us in verse 26. And he's the spirit of intercession in verse 27. And so the life of grace is really a life that is lived in the freedom of the Spirit. It's a life that is led by the Spirit. It's a life that is uh, motivated by the Spirit. And so I am free from guilt. I'm free from manipulation. I'm free from shame and insecurity and selfishness. And I'm free to love God and people the same way, without guilt, without manipulation, without shame, without insecurity or selfishness. In grace, I'm free to be led by the Spirit in loving God and loving other people. You know, the law tells you what not to do, but the Spirit tells you what to do. You know, for instance, the law says, thou shalt not commit adultery. But it's Paul by the Spirit who says, husbands, love your wives, and wives, respect your husbands. Thus, in grace, I'm free to live in the light of the sun, S-O-N. Everything I do is in the light. I have one life that I live. I don't have multiple lives. I don't have my work life, and my friend life, and my home life, and I don't have this compartmentalized life. I have one life that I live in the light of the sun. I'm not divided. And thus, my family, my friends, the whole church can celebrate everything that the Spirit is doing in my life. They can become part of that process. And that is the effect that grace has on my life. But grace is built on a foundation. And I want to talk a little bit about what that foundation is today. It's the foundation of God's love. Grace is built on the foundation of God's love. Paul says, this life that I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. And so I want to look at the foundation of grace, which is the love of God, and four barriers that keep us from receiving God's love. Four things that keep us from really actually experiencing fully in our life the love of God in the way that God desires for us. Now, Paul in writing to the Ephesians said in Ephesians 2, 4, and 5, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. So Paul says it plainly, it's the love of God that fuels the grace of God. Thus, if you don't understand God's love for you, you will struggle to understand his grace. 
And I often meet people like this. This is one of the things that we're often dealing with as we counsel people is, is helping them understand the grace of God. And as we help them understand the grace of God, we finally realize that, oh, they don't even know that God loves them. They struggle with the very basic premise that God loves them. And so because they don't understand that, it's hard for them to understand anything else there is about God. And if you don't understand God's love and grace for you, you'll believe that God's acceptance of you is based on your performance. And so if you do good, you know, if you're doing good, God loves you, God's going to bless you. But if you do bad, then you're fired. You know, and kind of like Trump and his show, you know, he fires you. But the wonderful message of the gospel is not only are you saved by grace, but your relationship with God is maintained by grace. So it's grace that brings you in and it's grace that carries you on. We don't ever get past grace. Grace isn't like the elementary thing that you are saved by grace, but now that you're, you know, now that you're in, you have to do, you know, pay your membership dues. And there's all these things that you have to do to be a member of this thing called the family of God. But you see, grace works not only to save us, but to maintain us, which means that the benefits of our salvation do not come based on our performance. They come based on the riches of God's mercy, as we read about in Ephesians 2. They come to us based on the riches of God's love, the riches of God's grace. It's because it's, it's based on what he has done for us, not what we can do in our own strength and our own power. Now, I talk with people and they'll say, yeah, I believe that. I, I really do believe that. But what's interesting is that when th something happens in their life, when a tragic situation happens, all of a sudden, they're not so sure if they believe that anymore. Because really, they don't really believe it. They really don't understand the profound nature of God's love and grace in our lives. I have a, uh, you know, I talked to a guy and, and he's got this thriving business, but when business is down, his first thing that he thinks is this, and, and you might think the same thing, but his first thing is, like, well, you know, I'm a sinner. I don't, I don't get it all right, so I got what I got coming to me. I somehow deserve this bad business that's coming in because of something I've done or maybe something I didn't do. He doesn't truly believe. Because if you truly believe this, if you truly believe what the Bible says about your relationship with God, then your relationship with God would be totally transformed. Your relationship with others would be totally transformed. You wouldn't be filled with anxiety and worry about the future. You wouldn't be wondering, you know, oh, I wonder if God's going to help me through this situation. You wouldn't be overcome with, with, um, with, with just that that feeling of being overwhelmed by life, you, those things wouldn't move you. You would believe that you are a new creation in Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, you would believe that you are free from the power of sin and death, Romans 8.2. You would believe that you are accepted in the beloved, Ephesians 1.6. You would believe that you are forgiven in 1 John 1.9. You would believe that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus in 2 Corinthians 5.21. And the greatest thing of all, you would know that you are greatly loved by God and you would understand that he started loving you while you were still a sinner in rebellion against him as Ephesians 2.4 tells us. And when you realize how God sees you, then you realize that you can come into his presence and you can leave all of that baggage at the door. 1 John 4.10 says, And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And I love that. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. You see, the law tells you, thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength in Deuteronomy. But grace says, for God so loved you. That's the difference. The law says you will love, but grace says God loves you. And it's the love of God that empowers your ability to love him back. We love him because he first loved us. The love that you have for God came from him. It wasn't in you. 
Now, I'm going to preach myself happy here in a second. Now, I want to talk about this word propitiation here in 1 John 4.10. It's an expensive word. You have to buy an expensive commentary to find out what it means. But I like to use the Bible to interpret the Bible. So to understand what this word means, you need to go to the Old Testament, to Exodus 25. And uh, St. Augustine said that new is in the old concealed and the old is in the new revealed. And so if you want to understand the New Testament, you need to look to the Old Testament. The Old Testament is the commentary on the New Testament. And when you look at the word uh, propitiation in the original Hebrew, the Hebrew word for, for this word is kephoreth, and it's, it's what we get the mercy seat from in the tabernacle. The mercy seat, kaphoreth. It's from the verb kafor, which means to cover over or to pacify or to make propitiation. And if we can look at the first slide here, it's a picture of the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament was the place that God promised to meet and speak to the Israelites. And he makes this promise in Exodus chapter 25, verse 22, when he says, And there I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are on the ark of the testimony, about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. We go to the next slide. It's a picture of the mercy seat here. And so this is the mercy seat. The mercy seat was above the ark. So you would have the ark underneath, and then you would have the mercy seat that sat on top of the ark. And you see the two cherubim that are there. And God says in his word in Exodus 25 that he will meet with, speak with you above the mercy seat between the two cherubim, the two cherubim representing the Holy Spirit. Now, why is that significant for us today? Well, the reason why it's significant for us today is because it shows us that God never meets with his people in the place of judgment. God always meets with his people in the place of mercy. The place of mercy, in the mercy seat. The mercy seat was to be placed on top of the ark. And this is significant. You're going to see this in a moment that the mercy seat was placed above the ark. Now, within the ark were certain contents. And we go to the next slide, we'll see what those contents were. The ark contained the gold pot of manna, contained Aaron's rod, and two stone tablets on which God had written the Ten Commandments. Now, why is that significant that those three things are in the ark of the covenant? Well, the reason why they're so significant is because those three items represent, are symbols of, man's rebellion against God. They represented God's case against man, why God uh, was right in judging man, why man is condemned. The first item, the pot of gold of manna, represented man's rejection of God's provision in the wilderness. You remember as the nation of Israel is going through the wilderness, they complained about God's provision. They didn't like manna. You know, they thought, it's like, what is this? First of all, manna means, what is this? So the whole, you know, they walk up and they go, what is this? It's like, maybe some of you have done that in your home. You come to dinner and you say, what is this? Um, but that's what, that's what they did. They just walked up and like, what is this? And after a while, they're like eating this and like, how much stuff can you do with manna, you know? But manna bread, you know, manna cotti. Uh, it's like you start running. I, I don't know if you make manna burgers, you know, they're like, like turkey burgers. But after a while, you're like, what do you do? What is this stuff? So they began to complain. And God saw that as a sign of rebellion. The rod of Aaron represents man's rebellion and rejection against God's leadership you know, against Moses. And then the third thing, the Ten Commandments, represents man's rejection of God's standard of holiness, his rebellion against God's standard of holiness. 
You know, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's no one that's able to keep all Ten Commandments, and thus it represents God's judgment against man. But because God delights in mercy, God places the mercy seat on top of the ark. So in a very literal way, mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy always triumphs over judgment. So you could see even in the Old Testament, God was sending a message to his people. Mercy triumphs over judgment. The mercy seat was over the ark. Now, once a year, during the Day of Atonement, also known as Yom Kippur, we'll come to the next slide, you would see the, the priest, the high priest, would take the blood of the sacrificial lamb and would enter the Holy of Holies and sprinkle it on the mercy seat. So the mercy seat was covered in blood. And so the sacrificial blood covered man's rebellion, and because of that, man is now forgiven. What is that a picture of? The cross. It's a picture of the cross. And so when it says that God cannot look upon man's sin, it's literal. The Bible's literal. Because when God looks down from heaven, what does he see? He looks down from heaven. The first thing he's going to see is the mercy seat. And what is the mercy seat covered with? The blood of the sacrificial lamb. And what is the mercy seat covered in blood covering? The symbols of man's judgment. So God doesn't see judgment. He sees mercy because the blood of Jesus covers you and I. Yes. Now, when the Hebrew scriptures were translated into Greek, which is known as the Septuagint, the Hebrew word for the mercy seat became helasterion. The helasterion uh, comes from the Greek word helasmos, which means the place where sins are forgiven. And when they take helasterion and they translate it into English, what do they translate it as? Propitiation. That's where that word propitiation comes from. So when Paul says that Jesus is our propitiation, what he is saying is that Jesus is our mercy seat. Jesus is the mercy seat. So when God looks down from heaven, he looks down upon us. We're in the ark. That's where we are. We're in the ark. We have in our bodies the reasons why God should judge us, our rebellion against his provision, our rebellion against his leadership, our rebellion against his standard of holiness. And yet over, over us, covering us, is the blood of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ himself, our mercy seat. And when God looks upon us, he doesn't see us, he sees Jesus. He sees Jesus. Now I'm getting happy. So when Jesus died on the cross for our sins, his blood was sprinkled over man's rebellion against God. And when God looks down and sees the blood of Jesus, he sees forgiveness. We are now forgiven. You and I are forgiven of all of our sins. Yes. So every heart that has been sprinkled clean by the blood of Jesus can now be drawn near to God, forgiven of all sin, totally accepted uh, by God. And now God meets with us and God speaks to us through Jesus, our mercy seat. It's powerful. It's wonderful. Now, the reality of this is why Paul says, hey, if you recognize you've been forgiven... If you recognize that God has, has had mercy on you, that you are covered by Jesus, now love one another. Forgive one another. Be kind to one another. Be gracious to one another because of what Jesus has done for you. Now, if you believe this, then you're not building a foundation on you loving God. It's not what I can do for God. 
You're building a foundation that is made out of God loving you. You're building on a foundation. God is the one that gives you the foundation. A foundation of God loving you. And that is the foundation of grace. What we experience in the, uh, in the grace of God is all because of the love of God that's been poured out, shed abroad in our hearts. It's what he has done for us. And when your life is built on the foundation of God's love, grace abounds. There's no condemnation, no separation from his love, and the Spirit is free to work in your life. Now that's the introduction. And so we're going to get into the text here in verse 31. Paul writes in Romans 8, 31, What then shall we say to these things if God is for us? Who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Now, in the next uh, few verses here, Paul is going to address four common barriers that we experience to receiving God's love. And the first one that is mentioned here in this text that I'm going to pull out for you is doubt. It's the belief that God is not for you, that somehow God is against you. If you notice here, Paul writes, if God is for us, if God is for us. And it's written in the conditional, but the way that Paul uses the conditional uh, tense is not to suggest that there are times when God isn't for you and God when there are times when God is for you it's not to suggest that that God's being for you is conditional that basically what he is saying is a statement of truth that God is for you and because this is true what I'm going to say next is true as well but you know there's some of us that believe that there are times when God isn't for us you know, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but if I were, there'd be many of us that would raise our hand and say, you know, there are times when I think God is for me, and there are times when I think God isn't for me. Usually it's when we're trying to find a parking spot. You know, and uh, my wife has the parking lot anointing. She can go into any parking spot at lot and this, you know, drive right up to the front, and it's almost like they were just waiting there for her. You know, and she just drives right in, like, yeah, they were just waiting for me. You know, God had it reserved. Me, on the other hand, it's like, that never happens to me. You know, it's like hit and miss. You know, usually I have to get the farthest part away and walk, and then someone kicks my tires, and, you know, she's got that favor on her life. But, you know, there's times when we feel that way. There's times when we feel that God isn't for us. And here's something that I, I want to talk about the law and grace for a second here to kind of give us a context, because the law is built on fact. The law is built on fact. And if you ever encounter the law, um, I'm not with David Zamora, so I know he has a lot of, um, or Trujillo, I know, I know they got a lot of experience with this. Um, but if you ever encounter the law, the, the law is based on fact. But grace is built on the truth. How so? Well, the law says the wages of sin is death. Everyone that sin dies. That's the fact. The wages of sin is death. But grace says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So the truth is, if you have received Jesus Christ, you have eternal life. Yeah, the fact is we all die, but the truth is we have eternal life in Christ Jesus. The fact is, the law says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But the truth says the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses every sin, and I am forgiven and declared righteous by God himself. That's the truth. And Paul uses the example of God delivering up his own son to prove that God is not against you. Because the fact says this, I owe God because I broke the law. If we were on the people's court, God would be, you know, he would be presenting damages done. He did damages against me. He broke my law. He owes me. But the truth is, Jesus paid my debt to God with his own life. He paid the price. And the conclusion is this. If God is willing to give up his only son to die in my place for my sins, 
It only makes sense that he will freely give us all things. Or what's better translated, wait, it gets better. Uh, what's better tra translated is that he's not just going to give us all things. He's going to give us the whole thing. He's going to give it to us all at once. He doesn't give us just all things. He gives us the whole thing. Now, why is that significant? Because there is a lie that sometimes we believe that God loves you when you're good, but when you're bad, he punishes you by withholding his love from you. And the truth is of Scripture that he doesn't love you more or less when you do good or when you do bad because he gives you all of his love all at the same time. He gives it all to you. The whole thing. So when you walked in today, you were as loved as you will ever be, and it doesn't matter what you did before you got here. You're as loved as you will ever be, and if you go out and you blow it on your way out of here, you will still be as loved as you ever will be. That's the nature of the love of God. And here's the thing. My unbelief does not change it. My unbelief doesn't change God's love. You cannot mess up God's love for you. You can't break it. You can't stop it. The only thing that you can do is you can keep yourself from receiving the full benefit of it through unbelief and through doubt. But even if I don't believe, it doesn't change God's love for me. Because he loved me when I didn't even know who he was. When I was a sinner. And so if you're here this morning and you're condemning yourself because you made mistakes in your life, if you're beating yourself up, we, we talked with someone just the other day who has been a Christian for 15 years and was beating themselves up over something that happened 15 years ago, thought, you know, I was, you know, I'm forgiven and all this stuff, but didn't realize that inside of themselves they were carrying the weight and the burden of that thing and, and they felt like all of the stuff that was happening in their life was somehow deserved. They were condemned. You can stop condemning yourself today because God loves you, and you can let him love you. The second barrier that people face is guilt. I feel guilty for what I've done. And usually it's because we feel like we've been accused, that there's those accusing us. In Romans 8.33, Paul says, Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Now that word charge means to name. It's the idea of being accused by name of committing a crime. You know, it's like when you, if you've ever been in a lineup, ask David Trujillo about this. Um, if you've ever been in a lineup, you know, the person goes, oh, he did it. They call you by name. They point at you. You're the one who did it. And how many of you know that's what the devil does to you and me? He's constantly before God saying, he did this, and they did that, and she did this, and she thought this, and she went over there and did that. Accusing us by name. But notice what Paul writes here. He says, it is God who justifies. What does it mean to be justified? To say it in its simplest terms, to be justified means to be declared innocent, to be declared innocent. In other words, it is God who declares you innocent, and it has nothing to do with the charges brought against you. It has nothing to do with what you have or haven't done. It has to do with what God has done for you. Paul could have easily written, who will bring a charge against God's elect? They've done a good job of cleaning up their act. They're following the law. They're observing, you know, the, the feasts and the holidays, and, and they're innocent. They're good people. But that's not what Paul wrote, because we're not innocent, declared innocent, based on our actions, our self-righteousness. It is God who justifies. And if God justifies, then it has nothing to do with me. It's not based on my good character, my reputation, my righteous actions. It's based on the love of God, and he declares me innocent. And so the next time the enemy comes and accuses you, usually it comes in the form of 
of a, 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 a friend or a mother-in-law. And um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But next time the enemy comes and accuses you, what do you do? You hold up your hands. You say, you're absolutely right. Guilty. I've done all that and more. You left some stuff out. Let me help you remember. <laughs> but here's the truth. I'm forgiven by Jesus Christ. He lives in my heart. I belong to him. I'm a child of God. I've been born again. And I have been declared righteous by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He loves me. He declares me innocent. The third barrier is condemnation. I feel judged by God. In verse 34, Paul writes, Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Condemnation not only says I'm guilty, but it says I'm unforgiven. I'm under judgment. Condemnation makes you feel like every bad thing that happens in your life is God punishing you. And usually it comes out when people are going through hard times. You know, when everything is good, we feel like God loves us. But when we go through difficult times, we feel like maybe God's forgotten us, doesn't actually love us. And Paul says the proof that you are not judged by God is found in the death of Jesus Christ on the cross and the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Because when Jesus died on the cross, your sins were forgiven. And when your sins were forgiven, you were declared holy and righteous. And when you were declared holy and righteous, the veil was torn from top to bottom and the holiness God, the holy presence of God was unleashed into the world. That very presence that before that moment would destroy all of sinful humanity now is able to be free in the world because of the blood of Jesus Christ, forgiving us of our sins. And through the resurrection, we are now made into new creations. And now Jesus is at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you. And that word intercession speaks of a defense attorney in a court of law. You know, every time the devil comes quoting the law to condemn you, Jesus, your high paid attorney says, all debts canceled, paid in full, forgiven. And here's what's funny, is that sometimes in our kind of weird way of thinking about things, we, we think, okay, well, then somehow, because of all that Jesus has done for me, I, I owe him something. And so we go to our attorney, our high-paid you know, attorney, Jesus, and we say, okay, Jesus, what's the bill? What's the damages? How much do I owe you? Do I owe you? And Jesus says, nothing. I did it for love. I did it because I love you. And that's what I want you to know. We're not judged. We're forgiven. The fourth barrier is separation. I feel like I'm forsaken by God, that God has forsaken me. In verse 35, Paul writes, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. When do you often feel the most forsaken by God? Usually it's when you're going through one of these things that Paul just mentioned, isn't it? When you're going through tribulation, which in the Greek means to get crushed. You know, you're getting crushed. Do you ever felt crushed by life? Or distress, which means getting squeezed. You ever felt like the circumstances around you are just squeezing in on all sides and you don't have any room to breathe? Persecution, when you're attacked for doing the right thing, 
I recently experienced some persecution in calling, you know, when Donald Trump declared a national day of prayer, I posted it on Facebook. Hey, Donald Trump, you know, uh, declared a day of prayer. And next thing I know, all the people that hate Trump just started putting, you know, dumping on Trump on my call to prayer. And, uh, and I said, listen, guys, I'm just inviting people to pray. You can pray for Trump, you know? I'm, this wasn't a political statement here. I'm like, what is wrong with you Christians? It's like, don't you wanna to pray together? So after I rebuked a few people, they apologized. <laughs> Famine. Maybe you're having a hard time putting food on the table. Nakedness. You can't afford nice clothes. You can't shop at Nordstrom's Rack anymore. You gotta to go to Ross's Dress for Less. <laughs> or peril, your life is in danger. Or a sword, you're being attacked. And when all of these things are happening in our life, it's easy to feel like God has forsaken us. But Paul says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. What does he mean by that? Well, first of all, he means this, that if you're going through any of this stuff, it does not mean that God is against you. Because people go through things. We're gonna go through things. In this world, you're gonna have tribulation, but what did Jesus says? But be of good cheer for what? I have overcome the world. Who lives in you? Jesus, who has overcome the world. And so Paul says, yet in all these things, we are more than what? Conquerors. Why? Because Jesus lives in us, and he has overcome the world. That word conquerors mean that we rise above. We're not defeated. We stand tall. We don't stay down. We move forward. And what gives us the power to keep going, to get through? It's the love of Jesus Christ. When, when you know, when you're confident that God loves you and you're not questioning it. When I go through attack, I'm not thinking God doesn't love me. I know God loves me. And now I'm going, okay, God, I'm under attack. You love me. What's the plan here? How are we going to get through this? Jesus living in me. And how many of you know that Jesus doesn't lose his battles? When I know Jesus loves me, I have confidence to face the giants in my life. I have confidence to face the losses because it's not just about the wins, it's also about the losses. I have confidence to face the attack because Jesus is living in me. I can rely upon his strength and his power because he doesn't lose his battles. And there's a song that we sing and there's a line that I love and in this line it says, the undefeated one is living in me. The undefeated one is living in me. So when you're feeling defeated, what do you do? You let Jesus love you. You come into church, you sit down and listen to the worship, and you let Jesus love you. You surround yourself with your brothers and sisters in Christ, and you let Jesus love you through them. Guys, this is a hard world. We can't do it on our own. We need men to stand with us. Get in those men's small group and let Jesus love you. And if you are feeling unloved, then just keep staying there until you get the message that Jesus loves you because he does and he is with you. When you sin and you feel condemned, let Jesus loves you. Let him love you. Because the more you let Jesus love you, the more you realize like Paul in verse 38, I am persuaded that neither death nor life, 
nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. How did Paul know that? How could Paul say that? Because Paul had been through every single one of those things. And in the midst of the most difficult times of his life, he recognized that none of it was a commentary on God's love for him, that God loved him, and that God was the only thing that would get him through it, and God did get him through it. I hate the people that make me feel afraid to be a Christian in our country. That are telling me about all the bad things the bad guys are doing and I better be careful. They better be careful. Because I got Jesus on my side. <laughs> Nothing can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Unbelief cannot separate me, cannot stop him from loving me. It can stop me from receiving it. But it doesn't stop him from loving me. Running from God can't stop him from loving you. Because you can go to the furthest place on this planet and you're going to find God waiting there for you. Atheism, God's not threatened by it. He doesn't believe in them either. Agnosticism, he's not sure about those guys either. <laughs> False religions can't stop his love. There's no demonic power in heaven or on earth powerful enough to stop the love of God. His love is relentless. And really for us, as believers, it doesn't matter if you've been a Christian for a minute or a hundred years. I know many Christians that are still running from the love of God. They haven't fully surrendered their lives to Him. They still think they know better and they can do better. I know of men that are businessmen that they cannot acknowledge that the success of their business is because of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're too busy claiming the credit for themselves, not recognizing that it is God who raises up and God who sets down. And so they're running from God right now. And it doesn't matter where you're at. Maybe you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ and you're running from God. But he's not running from you. In fact, he's running after you. And he's here this morning. And he's sent me to tell you that he loves you. And that whatever judgment you feel that you're under, he's forgiven you and you can come to him right now. You can lay down your whole life before him. You don't have to have anything separating you from his love. And maybe for you, it's bitterness you've been holding in your heart. And you need to bring that before the Lord because that bitterness in your heart has been keeping you from receiving God's love in your life. And you've been feeling condemned and judged by God. And he doesn't want you to be under that condemnation anymore. You might be here and you say, but I've lived this incredible life of sin. That's awesome. I mean, that's not awesome, but... But what is awesome is whatever you've done in the past, it doesn't matter because today you can begin a new start. You can receive the forgiveness of sins. You can receive the promise of heaven. You can surrender your life to Jesus Christ and be a new creation in Christ. 